Good morning. Happy Father's Day. Got my Father's Day cards right here. I am a Papasaurus Rex, according to Axel. So <clears throat> I've preached a lot of sermons um, in my life, quite a few of them here. This is not an easy one. Um, appreciate Malik's thoughts and his prayer and uh, all the people that have participated in. But they mentioned that Father's Day, while it's, it's happy, it's not happy for everybody. And it's not happy for some of you in the audience today or listening. So I struggled a little bit in preparation uh, for preaching on Father's Day only because you don't want to focus on the negative of fatherless homes because it's depressing. But you got to look at that along with the good things that we have too. Our culture, particularly in the United States, uh, devalues the importance of fatherhood. In devaluing the importance of fatherhood, tremendous damage is done to fatherless children in our homes. And we need to do something about that. We need to start with ourselves and do what we can to fix that, to correct that. And it starts with us guys. Because far too often, we abandon our responsibilities as fathers. And as I said, the consequences are dire. My computer and I are not on friendly terms right now. That's why there's no PowerPoint. But that's probably a good thing, because if I put statistics up there on the board, uh, you'd cry when you look at that. But we'll look at a few of the statistics in a minute. But our culture needs help in understanding the value and the importance of fatherhood. Our physical fatherhood and understanding our Father in Heaven, most of all. And if you want some evidence of how the culture has changed, I went back and I looked at family TV shows from history and how they portrayed families and fatherhood. The earliest one actually was based on a mom. It's I Love Lucy. But introduced Lucy and Ricky Ricardo, and this was a family. <laughs> Maybe not the most perfect family, but it was a family. In 1953, <clears throat> Danny Thomas started Make Room for Daddy, the series. And some of you kids are saying, what in the world is Mr. Stafford talking about? Your moms and dads can tell you when you get home. In fact, you can have fun this afternoon. At, you know, trivia, old, old movies. And then you go on, and we had Father Knows Best, Leave It to Beaver, My Three Sons, Bonanza, uh, the Brady Bunch, believe it or not, made its debut in 1969. Can you believe that? That might seem like that was yesterday. The Dick Van Dyke Show. The Flintstones. Good old Fred. Good Times. Happy Days. The Jeffersons. Family Ties. The Wonder Years. Bill Cosby. Everybody Loves Raymond. And then Archie Bunker and All in the Family comes along. So you can see that they've changed. And... Do you know what the longest running TV sitcom currently is? It's been 35 years and still going. Homer Simpson. And that's the father figure that we have right now is Homer Simpson. So, yeah, we've, uh, we've come down a peg, I think. A little bit of history about Father's Day. It was recognized by Richard Nixon when he signed into a law in 1972. 58 years after Mother's Day was signed into law by Woodrow Wilson, by the way. Uh, the idea for Mother's Day came from um, post-Civil War women who were tired of war and death and dying, and they tried to do something about it. 
And that was the start of it. And then later on, I believe it was in Washington, uh, a woman made the final campaign to honor her mother. Uh, and Woodrow Wilson signed it into law and recognized Mother's Day. And $25 billion, with a B, dollars is spent annually on Mother's Day between going out to dinner, gifts, flowers, Hallmark cards, $25 billion. Guys, they spend about 16 on us. And most of that, we're doing the buying. You know, we're going to get the steaks, or we're going to get the shrimp, or whatever it is. And we do the cooking, too. Uh, although I don't have to cook today. Beth is in Missouri visiting your mom, so I get taken out for Father's Day. But there's a difference between how we honor our mothers and how we honor our fathers. And again, that goes back to the fact that too many of our fathers don't earn any respect because they're not there. They're not around. And I guess it's kind of been like that throughout history. If you look at the bulletin article, you'll see that uh, there are no perfect families recorded in the Bible. There are good things recorded about families in the Bible, but there really aren't any perfect families. Uh, Adam, the very first man, he kind of messed up, didn't he? Noah found grace and favor in the eyes of the Lord, built the ark and was faithful, and then got off the ark and went and got drunk, and you know, his sons didn't honor him. Abraham. Abraham is the father of righteousness, a lover of God, but he didn't always trust in God. And his family kind of got messed up too. Isaac, Isaac favored one son over the other. And Rebecca favored the one that he didn't favor over the other. And they kind of had a messy family. Jacob, Jacob was a prolific father, had many, many children, but he played favorites. And he caused uh, serious pain with his family. And we could talk about Eli. Uh, we mentioned him. Randall mentioned him just a week or so ago, who was a priest. And he didn't make his sons obedient. And then Samuel, who Randall also mentioned, who Eli raised, basically, one of the greatest prophets and judges of all time was Samuel. He anointed Saul. He anointed David. Uh, but he didn't make his sons obedient. And then David himself. Um, what a messed up family David had. Mostly consequences of his sin. So there are no perfect human fathers that we have listed. The Bible doesn't say a lot about Joseph, but I have a feeling Joseph was a pretty awesome father. Uh, he took Jesus in. He trusted God, and he sacrificed. You know, when the angel came to him, he said, uh, trust in this, that Mary is going to conceive and have a child, and it'll be a child of God. Pretty hard thing to trust, isn't it? But he did. And he didn't want to disgrace her, so he was going to put her away quietly. He had every right to disgrace her. And he had every right to understand that, what are people going to think about me? About us? He was faithful to Mary. He was faithful to Jesus in raising him. Uh, when the Spirit came to him again and said, get up and go to Egypt. Leave everything. Get up and go to Egypt. He got up and he went to Egypt. So we don't know a whole lot about Joseph. But it seems to me that as well as God chose Mary to be Jesus' mother, he chose Joseph to be an earthly father. Fatherless children, needs and risks. In 2022, it was reported that there were 18.3 billion children under the age of 18, who lived in fatherless homes in the United States. One out of four. 
of our children, 18 and younger, are living in a home without a father. And there are many reasons for that. Some of the fathers, sadly, have passed away. But the majority of them just have no desire to be at home. You know, you could, you could produce children, guys. That doesn't make you a father. It doesn't make you a dad. 25% of children in our country, the United States of America, one nation under God, with liberty and justice for all, 25% of our children are living in fatherless homes. And you want to know how bad that is? The rest of the world, all the other countries of the world combined, the percentage of children living in fatherless homes in those countries, 7%. And we're at 25 it should make you want to cry. It should make you want to be angry. And why is that? Because our nation more and more is not paying attention to the true father. God is not valued. We say we're one nation under God, but he's not valued as he was. And the results of that are devastating uh, to our families. Devastating to our families. There's a bunch of other <clears throat> statistics. You can look them up if you want to have a downer. But you could also look them up because they're sobering. And they should impact us to say, we've got to do something. Starting in the church. Because the fatherless problem is in our church as well. I grew up in a fatherless home. Myself, my brother, my two sisters. My father was a, a complicated man, very talented in a lot of ways, but he had serious issues basically in following things that he wanted to do and not taking care of his family. And my mom, some of you knew my mom, she tried for a long, long time. Um, to make things work. But it got to the point, I was 12 years old, it got to the point to where him coming in and out, in and out, in and out of our lives was damaging us, the kids. And those of you that maybe live in fatherless homes, you know what that's like. You know how it hurts. And it got to the point for my mom that she said, that's enough. I could put up with some of this. I'm not going to let my kids be hurt anymore. So at 12 years old, that was really when my father uh, left for good. Good news is, as he got older, uh, he repented of that. And we were able to make peace. But I know what it's like to grow up in a fatherless home. There's things that a father gives to his children, a good father, that are irreplaceable. It could be something as simple as throwing a ball, going to a game, giving advice, teaching you how to drive, all those type of things. Sometimes we take those for granted, but kids that grew up without that know how important that is. And when you look at those statistics too, teenage pregnancies, three times more common from young girls from fatherless homes. Mental issues, health issues, poor grades in school, suicides, all of them skyrocket with children from fatherless homes. It's a crisis. We in the church need to do uh, something about that. Fathers have other responsibilities too. There's a singer-songwriter named Harry Chapin, who a lot of you know him. Again, young guys, ask your parents, who has Harry Chapin's guy? He wrote a famous song called Cats in the Cradle. And the basic story of the song is a father grows up, and he's a busy man, he's a successful man, and when his child is young, uh, he's working a lot. So as each verse goes on, there's not a whole lot of time for things. 
when his son is 10 years old, he says, hey, thanks for the ball, Dad. C can we play catch? Can you teach me to throw? And the dad says, not today. I got a lot to do. And the son says, that's okay. And he smiled as he walked away and said, I'm going to be like him. I'm going to be like him. And then the story goes on, and there's a twist. The son goes off to college, and the father's so proud of him. and says, hey, can we sit and talk for a while? He goes, I'm sorry, Dad. What I'd really like is just to borrow the car keys. Can I have them, please? And as it goes around, the, the son gets older, and the dad is retired, and he calls just to want to talk. He said, hey, Dad, I'm sorry. I can't really talk right now. My new job's a hassle. The kids have the flu, but it's been nice talking to you. And as he hung up the phone, it occurred to him, his son had grown up just like him. We get so busy with things in life, dads, that we forget the important things in life. And one of the things that is most important that we are woeful on is the way we treat our wives. You want to know how your boys are going to treat their wives, dads? They're going to treat them like you treat your wives. And far too often when we ignore our kids because of work, we ignore our wives the same. And I know it goes both ways, but that's an important lesson. Honor your wives. Does God not tell us that over and over and over and over? Honor your wives because your kids are going to look at that. We have another job in the church. As we look around our church family and we see fatherless homes, there's things that we could do as brothers and sisters to help families in fatherless homes, to help the children in fatherless homes. And I'll give you an example. Because as I told you, I grew up in a fatherless home. If it were not for people in the Church of Christ in Chicopee, Massachusetts, where I grew up, I wouldn't be here today. I just wouldn't. And uh, there were a lot of them that helped my mom. There were a lot of them that uh, helped us. And sometimes we didn't even realize the help until we got older, and then we did. One of those men is named Harold Higginbottom, and some of you might know Harold Higginbottom. He passed away this past year. But <laughs> Harold and Pat, his wife Pat, they had three kids. And Harold was a brilliant, brilliant engineer. He worked for Monsanto. And I didn't know this until I went to the funeral just a little while back, and his sons were telling me that the thousands of patents that Harold Higginbottom had, humble man, would have never talked to them. But you know the space rockets that go up in the shuttles? Harold designed the special coating that goes on there to protect them from burning up during reentry. That's just one of his many patents. Humble man, a God-fearing man, a beautiful soul. And Harold and Pat, like I said, he had three kids. And this was before the time of minivans. We didn't have minivans back then. What they had were these huge station wagons. You remember those? Monsters. You could see 10 people in those. You know, Pat and Harold always drove the biggest station wagon that was available. You know why they did? So that every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, they could pick up Nancy Stafford and her four kids take them to church. Every time they would pick us up and take us to church. And sometimes if mom needed to go grocery shopping, because my mother never drove a car, never had a license until she was in her 50s, uh, Pat and Harold, you know, hey, we're going grocery shopping. Do you want to come with us and do a grocery run? That's how they were. One last Harold Higginbottom story. My sister Fiona uh, I'm the oldest. Fiona is two years younger than I. Dirk is seven years younger. And then Heather, our youngest sister, is nine years younger. Every one of those kids came back for Harold's funeral. My sister, Fiona, flew in from Houston, Texas. That's how important the Higginbottom family was to us. 
And at the end of the funeral, as a lot of our customs are, there's a time for open mic where people could come and share. So my sister Fiona went up and she said, I got to tell you a story about Harold. She said, when I was 14, 15 years old, I was in a bad place in my life. And I was very rebellious. And I made a decision I was running away from home. Fortunately, one of her best friends knew her plans and called my mom. They told my mom, Fiona's running away. And I think she might be going here. So the first thing my mom did was she picked up the phone and she called Harold Higginbottom. I told Harold what was going on. And Harold said, I got it. And he got in that big old station wagon and he went looking for Fiona. And here's how Fiona tells the story. She's walking down a street on the way to wherever it was she thought she was going to go. And Harold pulled up on the side, pulled the window down. And these are her words. She says, had it been anybody else other than Harold, I would have bolted and run the other way. But when I saw it was Harold, I knew he was there because he loved me. So she got in the car, and it took an hour for them to drive home, I guess, because they were talking. And Fiona said, that moment changed my life. If you were to meet my sister today, she is one of the most spiritual women you could ever meet. Uh, and Harold Higginbottom and Pat Higginbottom and their family had a tremendous impact on the four fatherless kids that lived in our house. And we have the opportunity to do acts of kindness and love for our fatherless children and our single moms. It's not easy being a single mom. It's not easy being a mom at all. But when you're doing it by yourself, it's hard. It's hard. And Satan will use that hardship to attack single moms, attack their faith. We need to help. We absolutely need to help. We have a perfect father in heaven. We can't describe how much he loves us, but look at what he's done. He created each of us in his own image. He sent his only son to die for us. He provides for us materially, emotionally, spiritually. If our fathers, earthly fathers, could know that love and embrace that love, our fatherless problems would go away. They would. If you grasp the depth of God's love, how can you fall away? It's almost impossible. It's almost impossible. How can you not treat your children or your wives well when you realize how God treats you? You know, we could be, uh, we could be firm uh, disciplinarians sometimes, but we need to look in the mirror and realize that we better not be harder on our kids or our wives than we are on ourselves. And we better want grace and mercy for them like God gives grace and mercy to us. Let's look at a passage in, in Romans chapter 8. And if you guys want to put it up on the board, it's Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, 
but you receive the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, that we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Children of God, heirs of God. What does God own? Everything. Just camp on that for just a bit. Everything is God's. And you're an heir. I don't know if you expect to get an inheritance from your folks when they pass away, but you know, it might be a few dollars to, to put here. You're an heir of the creator of the universe. What's your inheritance going to be from that father? And your co-heirs with Christ. Wow. Christ is going to share his inheritance with us and let some other heirs come in? Uh, he must not have the attitude that the older prodigal son had. Co-heirs with Christ. Jesus wants you to be with him where he is. That passage of John 17 that Carl referenced, we'll talk about that. He wants you to be with him where he is. He wants to share his lordship, his godness with you. Because you were created not only in God's image, but God said, let us make man in our image. Jesus loves you so much that he died for you. And everyone can have that child position with God, heirs with God, co-heirs with Jesus. Everyone that will accept and will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's the answer for fatherless homes. That's the answer for all of our weaknesses and all of our trials. We're going to close, and we're going to close five minutes early because I think it's important. Uh, it's always important to finish on time if we can. But it's important that we have, even if it's just five extra minutes after we close, uh, to visit with one another. And there may be people that you've had thoughts of, I, I should encourage this single mom or this person. Or, it doesn't have to be just single moms. There are other people, brothers and sisters here, that you know are hurting. And it's too often we say, I should, I should say something, or I should send a card, I should, and then we don't do it. It's amazing what you could accomplish in five minutes if you decide to do that. So we're going to stand, and we're going to sing a song of invitation. If you have a deed, uh, come while we stand, and we'll pray with you. And then after that, song is done, uh, we have a couple of announcements uh, to share with you. So let's stand.